Welcome everyone to today's webinar, How Intermountain Healthcare and Henry Ford Health System are working towards a frictionless patient financial experience. I am Christelle Kazaka with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of an hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box that you see on your screen. We're looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link that you used to log in to today's webinar to access the recording. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Will Riley to introduce our speakers and begin today's presentation. Thank you, Christelle. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Will Riley. I am the head of marketing at VisitPay. Um, VisitPay is a patient payments platform focused on serving large integrated health providers across the US and helping them meet the needs of their patients. We are headquartered in Boise, Idaho. And from here, we serve clients across 15 states who are deploying and using our technology uh, now in just under one in 10 US not-for-profit hospitals. In 2001, we saw the first consumer-driven health plans appear. But it wasn't until the advent of health savings accounts and the arrival of the Affordable Care Act that the industry started to see widespread adoption of health plans that reflected the cost of, care, of health care more directly onto the patient. Opinion on their effectiveness at controlling costs and unnecessary utilization of the healthcare system may be mixed, but one thing is certain, they have put a spotlight on how patients and providers alike manage bigger individual bills and mounting patient financial responsibility. At the same time, accelerating digitization in all industries has changed patient expectations of what a bill paying experience should look like. Couple those shifting expectations with the COVID pandemic and the healthcare industry is experiencing what the New England Journal of Medicine calls an immediate digital revolution. So as we turn the page into 2021, what's the state of the patient financial experience? How is that experience impacted by the advent of new digital front doors designed to cover all patient interactions with the health system beyond just the financial? What are the key patient satisfiers in a contemporary approach? And when you get those right, what are the returns for the health system in terms of better financial performance and improved patient loyalty? With me to discuss how to lead with digital and design a frictionless patient financial experience are three leaders and active participants in the space. They are Todd Craighead, the Vice President of Revenue Cycle, Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City, Utah. Todd, please say hello. Hey, hi guys. Excited to be here to, to chat with you. Great to have you, Todd. The VisitPay team has had the privilege of working with Todd and his team since 2014. And today, just over half a million Intermountain patients have used our platform to help manage their medical bills since we introduced it in mid-2017. Second, Eric Neal. Eric is the Director of Patient Pay Services at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. Eric. Hi, Will, thanks for having me today. Eric, thanks so much for being here. Really, really pleased to have you with us. Uh, the Henry Ford team went live with VisitPay at the end of July, 2019, and about 175,000 Henry Ford patients have used VisitPay in, in that time. And finally, um, going back to Utah, uh, Mac Boiter. Uh, Mac is a research director at Class Research. Mac, would you say hello? Yes. Hello. Hi there, Will. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, participate here today in this in this webinar. Great to have you, Mac. Thanks so much for being here as well. Uh, Mac and his team recently completed the industry's first comprehensive survey. I, I, I think it was. I haven't found another uh, of the patient finance platform market. Uh, Class published its findings in December 2020. So Mac is both a very keen and very up-to-date observer of the shifts and trends in the space. And Mac will be complementing the observations of uh, Todd and, and Eric with that broad uh, perspective. 
So I'm really pleased to be hosting this conversation with three distinguished and experienced leaders. We'd like you to be a part of it too. Um, you should see, as Christelle mentioned at the beginning, a, a question and answer uh, area on your console. So please use that um, and please put questions in there. We will ask, answer some as we go, I, I think, um, but we also have some dedicated time at the end of our session uh, for a Q&A period. So don't be shy, uh, please ask away and, and ask, us, ask us questions. So um, let me move us along here. We have organized the discussion today around three areas that we see coming up time and time again in our work uh, discussing patient financial health with health systems across the country. And these are, I, I'd say, I think perennial, perennial themes, um, if you like, around the patient financial experience. So the three areas of focus that we'll be looking at in detail are first, integration. How should the patient financial experience show up in the broader digital experience offered by the healthcare provider? We're lucky in Todd and Eric because, uh, as we'll hear, Intermountain has built their own digital front door solution and embedded the VisitPay application called Intermountain Bill Pay firmly into that. And in Henry Ford, we have a really mature and scaled out MyChart uh, implementation. So we can look at that from two different aspects. And we'll be discussing what happens when you get that integration and that experience right in terms of patient adoption and uh, payment rates. The second area that we'll look at is transparency. We thought it would be good to zoom into then the patient financial experience itself and get Todd and, and, uh, and Eric and Max perspective on some of the key things that matter to patients in creating a transparent and really usable digital experience. And then we're going to end our third, our third area of focus. We've called the digital experience versus the revenue mindset. This is something that I, as a marketer, find very interesting because today's revenue cycle leaders think more and more like marketers focused on engagement, engaging patients, attracting them to this process and this experience. It's less of a hard push on revenue and more about creating a great experience, knowing that patient satisfaction and revenue will flow from that. Uh, so that'll be a really interesting third area. We'll talk about measuring success and how we do that and things like net promoter score and loyalty. We'll end then with a discussion on lessons learned before we transition into our Q&A period. So let's begin with uh, integration and this theme about how the patient financial experience should show up and can be part of modern ways of engaging the patient like in digital front doors. And I mentioned that we're really lucky with uh, Todd's experience at Intermountain. Uh, Intermountain recently implemented a new digital front door. Todd, let's start. Can you tell us about what was your role and the role of the revenue cycle team in helping shape the overall digital front door experience at Intermountain? Uh, well, thanks, Will. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is really critical because the journey of the consumer, the journey of the customer um, begins long in advance. And so, you know, as we went through at Intermountain, this exercise of trying to describe what would be the best um, experience or journey, particularly as the consumer then enters our system more deliberately, right, uh, and becomes a patient. And we knew that there was, it was critical that we define something that made sense. And so, and we really kind of narrowed that down into three real key categories, finding care, which I think is obvious to everybody. Um, how can they navigate a course? And we in the revenue cycle are actively involved in that to some degree, probably not as much as others. Um, how do we manage care? Certainly, you know, our, our, our partners and clinical folks are active in trying to manage the care that's delivered. And then the third leg of that stool was paying for care. And so we helped um, as we tried to define what could we do to remove or eliminate friction um, from the patient's experience, that journey, if you will, when they touched the revenue cycle, whether it be at the point of registration or pre-registration or scheduling, at the point that they're, they're um, having care and it's being documented or coded or collected, and then obviously that paying for care, how do we 
influence that and support it so that that patient's experience um, is not um, um, disrupted in a way that would um, cause harm. So, I mean, we and we've been actively involved um, as a part of the My Health Plus um, design work and working obviously with the, our visit pay partners as well to integrate in that paying for care component. So, I mean, it, it was critical for us to be able to do that. Excellent. And to, to uh, My Health Plus is the name that Intermountain has given. That, that's the brand that you've created for your digital front door platform. Is that is that correct? That's right. Excellent. So, can you tell us a bit more about it, Todd? Um, we've got a chart here that you, you that you've used, I know, before to sort of talk about what it looked like for the patient before and what it looks like with My Health Plus now. Can Can you talk us through that? So I think it's safe to say that there's a lot of fragmentation in revenue cycle across the country. And a lot of organizations are, are accelerating the pace around how do you bring those together. We, we were in a similar um, circumstance, right? And so we identified all these friction points um, for the patient. And I would say for the customer consumer initially before they became a patient, and, and which required that we try and create this connected point of view um, albeit in a virtual environment. Um, little did we know when we started to design what we were doing that we would find ourselves in a pandemic last year that would then further um, ex accelerate the use of some of this integration that we talked about, but significant investments with external third parties, um, certainly leveraging the environment that we have built with Cerner to try and make certain that we in integrate in key components of that technology, given that it is a source of record for us. Um, as well as some of uh, key partners, uh, um, our partnership with R1 from a revenue cycle perspective, how would we integrate in the workflow drivers that they um, were relying on as a part of the patient experience? Uh, and then certainly um, making it so that it could address the needs primarily from a telehealth. Obviously, how can uh, it support that? We found that the top three things at our digital front door, the My Health Plus app, um, provides his insight into and connection to, t to telehealth, which was, like I said, very important. Um, and this interaction with the clinical um, folks from a clinical messaging perspective. And then the third was really building how folks could actively engage inside of that technology. So creating the seamless link, making it fairly intuitive um, was pretty important at, at Intermountain. I, I, you shared with me uh, last week when we were talking, you say making it fairly intuitive. I'd say Intermountain's done a better job than that. You shared extraordinary sign-up numbers uh, for My Health Plus that you were seeing. Yeah, I mean, we've got, you know, 50,000 users that are jumping on weekly. I mean, we, we have a lot of people who are actively interacting with our system, mm -hmm. and, and that growth continues, right? Um, it is... Um, the shift um, to using that as a means to manage um, is really relevant today. Um, and we're seeing, you know, broad spectrum of users, if you will. Um, I think before there was um, a certain segment of the population that was more actively engaging by way of some, some you know, automated or virtual method. And now we see the bro a broadening of that spectrum of the, the folks who are engaging in that regard. So. It, it really helps to create this seamless brand. It helps to create this, this place to integrate and, and to quickly get in. Um, 25 to 25% signups for our visit pay technology. It's been, it, we've been very pleased with um, what's happened as a result of integrating through this, this through our My Health Plus app. Yeah, let, let's look at that a little bit because we've got a chart here that shows some of the, the patient experience and um, you can see, I think it's the third image on the screen shows a billing experience. And, and you know, obviously the VisitPay team work very closely with you to, to integrate into the application. There's t a technical component to that. There's a brand component as well, isn't, isn't there? I mean, we, we want to show up in a way that reinforces your brand. This is not about engaging with VisitPay. It's about engaging with Intermountain Healthcare. Can you just talk a little bit about that, Todd, and how your team and our team approach that? Yeah, I think that that was one of the um, most, um, I would say, encouraging outcomes that I saw from a branding perspective. And I would suggest that, it, that it's true for those who were involved in the development efforts for My Health Plus. In fact, I visited with one of the key developers even this morning talking a bit more about 
How do we go to the next level? How do we create opportunities for the patients that include um, extending their abilities to leverage the visit pay technology, right, and make payment? So it, obviously um, the visit pay folks have been very instrumental in adapting to um, Intermountain's branding, um, which we think is, is very important. We want the consumer patient to feel as though they're inside of one platform doing the work that they're doing. And while we might give them some um, doors that they can open in order to um, extend the functionality or leverage the functionality that VisitPay has, it really looks and feels like um, Intermountain Healthcare, which is very important for us. And, and we also, given the, given the fact that we are an integrated delivery system, integrating in our health plan was critical mm -hmm. as a part of this. And I'll talk a bit about, about that maybe later. Yeah, perfect. So that, that's great, and we're thrilled to see, I think, 20, you mentioned 20, 25% of visit pay starts now at Intermountain are coming through the digital front door alone. So the website, obviously, and, and other sources providing the rest of it, but it's become a very, very important channel uh, for all of us to, to engage your patients. So thank you for sharing that overview. Yeah. I'm, going to, um, I'm going to switch gears now, and we'll go to, to Eric in Detroit, uh, because it's, it's a very interesting um, a kind of parallel story in a way, uh, because Eric, uh, obviously Henry Ford is, a, is an Epic-based health system. Uh, so, t so tell us, how, how is Henry Ford looking at the digital front door space and an opportunity? Yeah, so at, at Henry Ford, we run Epic and we have a, a fairly robust uh, population in my chart. Uh, we're around 400,000 active users in any 12 month period. Uh, so we have that foundation there to, to engage with the patient digitally. Uh, what we're really focused on now is the, that second generation of the digital front door. Uh, you know, we have quite a, quite a large committee uh, across the health system with clinical leaders, with access leaders, uh, with revenue cycle leaders, uh, to make sure that we have this holistic approach to the front door, uh, because it's more than just uh, the website. It's more than just my chart. Um, and I think there's a, a, a greater and greater focus on making sure we select the right vendors and the right products and that they really communicate and integrate with, uh, the, with my chart or, or other vendors that we might be using. And uh, Eric, that's great. It's so interesting to see how people are approaching this. And, and you obviously started on the financial experience specifically um, some time ago with us. I mentioned we went live in July 2019. So wind back the clock to 2018 and so on. We, were, we started talking. How were you looking at the financial experience from a digital perspective at that point? What were you, what were you looking for? Well, you know, it was more and more uh, obvious that the financial experience contributed to the patient's overall experience. Uh, and so we really had to focus and make sure that, um, we, you know, we could provide the best financial experience for the patient uh, because, you know, regardless of the clinical experience, if we, if we don't get it right uh, at the back end, uh, the patient's gonna let us know. Uh, historically, Henry Ford was probably um, similar to peers and what I would consider now an antiquated or traditional approach uh, you know, we statemented patients, four or five statements. Um, as balances aged, we started to make phone calls, uh, but really pretty basic digital tools. And so for us, the big drive was just improving that financial experience because we knew it would improve the patient's uh, uh, experience. And we wanted something that was well-designed, that was self-service. It was really important to us that the patient could resolve uh, their financial experience in a positive way by themselves and, and, you know, using the right digital tool. Excellent. Thank you. And so let's look at that. Let's look at what happened. And I see a question come in <clears throat> from, from Anita about, does Henry Ford offer visit pay functionality outside of my chart? Uh, that's a great tee up actually for where we're going, because one of the things that Henry Ford has done, I think, uh, someone who's been privileged to partner with them over this time is really stress Henry Ford bill pay, as we call visit pay at Henry Ford, as the destination for payments, but doing so across all channels, not just my chart, but the website and so on as well. Eric, could you talk a little bit about that and, and some of the results we've seen in terms of usage as a result? Yeah, so we, we do, to, to answer Anita's question, we, we do allow a patient, of course, to log directly into bill pay. Uh, we, we find that most patients 
follow that traditional MyChart login. Uh, they can get all their information in one place. Uh, and, and so the single sign-on into the bill pay application uh, just makes that seamless for the patient. Uh, and it's, it's really easy for them to use. I uh, wanted to share this, this chart. We can certainly see uh, how the users grew so quickly. Um, we, we start there along the bottom. It's just months since general market release. That's when we went live with our bill pay application. Uh, you know, by, by month three, we were at 50,000 users. By month nine, we were at 100,000 users. And so it's really just grown fast with a focus on, you know, optimizing the MyChart login. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that our leadership was engaged, that our patients and uh, rather employees were engaged um, to, to help patients through any issues they might have with sign up and to encourage them to sign up. And we really did a lot on the website as well uh, to make it clear what the product was and the advantages that it had. Yeah, well, hey, yeah. well, uh, what I, one of the things I might mention too is Intermountain likewise stood up um, Intermountain Bill Pay, which was the visit pay portal before Intermountain developed the My Health Plus app and then integrated in. Yes. And, and we had, you know, we, we went in a different route around how we um, obtained users, but we had, you know, 100, 150,000 subscribed users that were active and over the course of about a year and leveraging the My Health Plus, that just grew exponentially. I think last year we ended near the 250,000 mark. Yeah, fully fully registered users. That's right, Todd. And and so fully registered users meaning people who have actually opted in for electronic billing, and half a million uh, users, including people paying in visit pay as a guest. So uh, a very large population indeed. So um, going back to you, Eric. So we you know you created this great experience. You promoted it well. Uh, let's look at this because I think this is important in terms of reflecting on the outcome that you've had from a payment perspective and from a monthly revenue perspective. Could you take us through this chart, please? Yeah, sure. So it, it's helpful to explain, I think, by color first. Uh, the, the gray columns are our historical uh, payments from the same period last year. Uh, and and they, they do even have um, an inflation adjustment to make sure they're topical to this year. The blue payment then is what we're seeing uh, in the new bill pay application uh, in terms of dollars, of course. Uh, and so uh, you look at the first six months, you know, there's an adoption period. We, you, you know, we expected that. We anticipated that it would take some time uh, for patients to convert into bill pay, to sign up, uh, you know, into bill pay. But really by month six, we're, we're seeing bill pay outperform uh, what we've seen historically. Um, uh, so that was a quick win. It grew very strong uh, compared to previous year. Uh, and then, of course, what we couldn't expect was that the impact of COVID uh, and the recession. Uh, you know, the, the decline was as soon as we saw those elective surgeries being canceled, uh, gross charges sort of evaporating. Uh, so the, it definitely was an unexpected impact. But, but ultimately, you know, as we look at that recession, post-recession uh, period, we're outperforming our historical information. Yeah, it's been very exciting to see this uh, see this transition and and put this tool in the hands of patients. Um, there's a question come in: Can they create their own payment plans? A absolutely, and and the whole idea yeah. of giving people an experience that makes sense to them, financial options that make sense to them, and then watching them go, right, Eric, is, is right. Very, very satisfying for all of us. Yeah, so so the patient's in charge of their financial experience, and we're in charge of those guardrails to make sure they, they agree with our policy and philosophy. That's an excellent way of putting it, isn't it? And the platform automates that relationship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So thank you, Eric, very much. So let's round out this section, Mac. I'd love your perspective on this. You, we've heard from two leaders here with, with really mature and sophisticated implementations of both VisitPay and MyChart and a digital front door. But what, what, does, what does your research show about the role of the financial experience and the overall modern digital patient experience? Thank you, Will. Yeah, the class of research uh, has historically looked at various parts of these areas. This, uh, to your point earlier that you made, uh, this is the first year the class has actually been able to get a critical mass of vendors and participants to really be able to, to deliver some robust uh, reporting on the, on the segment. To your question, it, it, 
I, I think that the process has been maturing, has been changing over the last four to five years, especially. But uh, I know that Todd and Eric, uh, to your points that you just shared a moment ago, COVID absolutely has accelerated uh, the overall process of trying to remove the stumbling blocks, remove the issues, uh, add to the, that frictionless experience of how do we not only imp improve the patient financial experience, meaning uh, feeling like the patient is empowered to be able to, to that question that was asked just a minute ago, which is a great question, be able to make your own payments, having control, being empowering the, the patient to have that flexibility and that control uh, not only improves their overall perception of the health system or the provider organization they're working with, but our research shows that it also increases revenues. So those are the two aims, obviously, uh, for anyone who's looking to adopt a solution like this or looking to move in this direction. And historically, what we've also seen is a trend away from uh, traditional statements, uh, whether they're paper or digital, although that is still a component that people, you know, in certain demographics, I know, Todd, you brought that up. That's an excellent point. Some demographics still value that, and that's certainly part of that experience. When we did our research, the number one response in terms of the primacy or the importance that provider organizations play on, on the vendor they're looking at or the segment they're looking at was the flexibility of a payment portal, having that ability for those self-pay plans, having the opportunity to, again, empower their patients with those tools to be able to do that. And I think uh, with Eric speaking about what they've done there at Henry Ford, I, that, that is absolutely reinforced by our research, uh, mm -hmm. not just with uh, his organization, which is fantastic and the, the outcomes there, improvements and so on, but we're seeing that across the board from provider organizations that we spoke to nationwide that this is definitely the trend and it's only been accelerated again by COVID. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, lots of great, great, very much. Um, I'm going to move and talk about the second topic, which is uh, transparency. What we wanted to do here was, like I said at the start, just zoom into the financial experience and get Todd and Eric's perspective on what, what matters most in terms of um, uh, being transparent and open to patients about the financial experience from their perspectives. So we're going to start with Intermountain. Um, so Todd, what have, what have you learned that's important to the patients in terms of being transparent from a billing perspective? Well, I, and I think, Will, it's, it's safe to say that it's a fairly complicated exercise, right? There's a lot of folks that are involved. You know, the payers um, certainly are doing things uh, in the background, providers, the patients. I, I think I saw Tom had asked a question about how do you separate or the insurance and the patient components apart? Well, one of the things that we've done clearly to uh, assist in that is to incorporate in the, the EOB that comes from our, uh, you know, our um, health plan, Select Health. And that's real critical, right? Because it gives us a mechanism for reconciliation that can then occur inside of um, the, the technology and, and therefore it lends credibility to what the patient's looking at. It, they can say, oh yeah, okay, that looks like that's where I am in my accumulators, that's where my deductible or my coinsurance balances are, and now I can see what my liability is versus what um, the health plan that, that I happen to participate in has taken care of on my behalf. And so integrating that in was very um, critical for us. And then just add, add a little bit of icing on the cake, right, which was to make certain that, that folks um, could have access to their health savings account. And, and many um, folks use that, obviously, or leverage that to assist with a payment and particularly to assist with payment plans. Um, I saw another question regarding, you know, whether or not we've seen a reduction in bad debt and bad debt accounts. I would certainly tell you that by nature, the fact that we've allowed the patients to self-service, to leverage the various means they can to make payment on a payment plan by their HSA or their you know, credit cards, et cetera, and having transparency into the, the health plan components, we've certainly seen um, a good uptick in the amount of folks who are going there to pay as opposed to just not doing anything at all. Um, so having all that stuff in one spot, it, it's pretty critical um, for the patients, and it provides, I think, an added layer of transparency that allows them to find a way within the guardrails that were mentioned to have a resolution on their accounts. Yeah, perfect. 
And, and Todd, you mentioned Select Health, and I know we're going to come back to that a little bit later on, but um, I think in your implementation, you show EOBs for not just Select Health, but for, I think, uh, most of your m major insurance partners. Is that is that, I think that's right, yeah. Based upon the information that comes back to us, we're able to, to show um, the EOB based upon the explanation of benefits that come back. Yeah. Lovely, thank you. So, Eric, let's let's get let's get your take on this too. Um, at, at, at Henry Ford, I think I think you have some real similarities actually in in perspective from from, from Todd. Yeah, you know we do. So, uh, Henry Ford has its own insurance plan as well, HAP, and uh, you know having the most tra transparent uh, patient experience for those HAP Henry Ford members is really important to us. Uh, so we do the similar things that, that Todd mentioned. Uh, we display the EOB. Um, we ourselves use health equity. We display the health equity HSA widget. Uh, so our employees can log on uh, to pay a bill. Uh, they can do a single sign-on into health equity. They can see their health equity balances and make payments. Uh, and we're, we're really engaged with, with HAP to uh, better integrate our platforms so that a patient can move more seamlessly, you know, from HAP to Henry Ford or vice versa as they're trying to navigate that. We find, uh, you know, like everybody else, that pa uh, our patients have a limited attention span. So, right, it's important to get the information in front of them in an easy to consume format. Um, we, we find in customer service, no, no matter what we do, we, we struggle to move the needle on the number of calls we might get for a patient just asking us to explain their bill. And so we find that folks that are self-servicing through the digital tool uh, have those, those data points right in front of them, and it's finally reduced some of our phone calls. Yeah, our research shows that the EOB is the most important thing that patients look for um, to understand and give them confidence to pay. Um, so I think that you're right. It's a key satisfier and hopefully re re reduces, like you said, the inbound, some of the inbound calls you get. Um, I wanted to broaden out a little bit, Eric, into the perspective around Detroit specifically, because one of the things that um, struck me certainly as we collaborated with you through the early days of the pandemic was how uh, well you moved as a health system to um, make bill pay the place to get, let's say, compassionate and helpful financing. And we've got a couple of screenshots here from your website of, of how you did that. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you approached that back in May, June last year? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Will. Uh, I pulled two stats that I wanted to share because, you know, every health system was, was impacted and is still impacted uh, by the pandemic. But uh, you know, Michigan, uh, Comerica reports that Michigan's GDP fell 41 percent uh, and an annualized basis compared to the U.S.'s decrease of about 33 percent. The Free Press, which is a Detroit uh, uh, news area, said that our unemployment rate in the city of Detroit was at 50 percent, uh, nearly four times the rate prior to the pandemic. So it was just unimaginable change uh, in a very short time. Uh, so, so we knew bill pay was key in keeping the patients uh, informed and, and giving them options. Uh, we furloughed some of our staff uh, when it was the right time to furlough. We added messages for those folks that didn't want to engage digitally to encourage them to, to self-service, uh, you know, or really uh, might have a longer wait time on the phone there. Uh, but obviously we knew bill pay was the most efficient. It really allows us to be consistent from a policy perspective. Uh, you know, we, we give those guardrails out there. Patients have the ability to look at different options, but they're all within policy, which we think from a compliance standpoint is really important. Um, and, and then it wasn't just about paying your bill. It was about understanding the options that are available. And so on the website, you know, we did update a lot of areas to just give guidance on what to do if you're financially impacted. Uh, you know, and, and what we were changing in the health system to make sure that you were going to be okay through the pandemic. Um, within bill pay, uh, we implemented a number of features. We did payment holidays, uh, again, with guardrails, which basically would allow somebody on a payment arrangement to skip a payment, uh, to skip uh, so many payments. I think we were allowing up to three at one point. 
Uh, we were doing deferred payments, so you didn't have to pay today. You could catch up later. Uh, but really just offering flexibility within the application because we realize when a patient's on a payment arrangement, when they're engaging with us, if we can work with them, especially you know in this unprecedented time, they were much more likely to continue to pay. Yeah, that's great, Eric. I think that's right. May, one of the things I want to just throw out there as a part of that is that uh, it was amazing how quickly the technology was adapted to do what was just described to offer those payment holidays. Hmm. We were on the phone. We talked about it. The group got together and visit pay then went about the business of making it happen inside of the technology and and that that is one of the things that's that's made the integration to Intermountain and I suspect with Henley Ford so good is the willingness of visit pay to step up and help us with those changes. Yeah, it was an amazing time. Thanks so much for saying that, Todd. It was an amazing time and I remember going through our product sprints, three or four of them working with you all directly to think about what we needed to do. And we really leaned on our 2008 experience from that recession. Um, and, and it was exciting um, as well as being sort of dramatic and sad and necessary all at the same time. It was an intense period. Um, you know, the other thing, Will, um, with, with a self-service digital tool is that the patient is much more likely to accept the terms that you offer them within the tool. It's the analogy of the airplane seat. Uh, you know, if you're assigned the middle seat, you're probably the first person at the desk asking for a window seat. Uh, but but if, you, if you see that option and it's the only seat available, you're much more likely to take that arrangement. And so um, what, what we found are folks that, that were engaged digitally were taking advantage of the options uh, and, and quite satisfied because they were there. And so it, it made our lives in customer service uh, a little bit easier because uh, patients were able to take care of themselves and in, in, in a satisfied manner. Thanks, Eric. Matt, round us out on this section, please, with what you saw in your research interviews in terms of what mattered to providers around transparency and, and the kind of key tenets of the self-service billing experience. Just to parlay off of what Eric just shared there, that is that is absolutely top of mind. So the ability, you know, obviously health systems ultimately are in the in the business of business. At the same time, they are a compassionate organization at its heart. I have not, in all in all the time that I have engaged with healthcare providers across the gamut of healthcare, they, they almost to a person have at their core a strong sense of community, a strong sense of compassion for their fellow man, fellow people. And as a result, that's why they're in healthcare. And so the beautiful part about what VisitPay and companies like VisitPay are doing is they're trying to meet patients where they're at. They're trying to provide that flexibility, that uh, cadence to, in, in a very compassionate way, develop an opportunity for them to uh, receive care uh, and then to you know pay for that care and find, find methods and, and things that work best for them, whether that's a payment plan. Uh, to Eric's point about the payment holidays and appreciate that. The, these are the kinds of things that class has watched uh, during COVID generally, like how do vendors react during COVID? Did they offer? I, I've lost Mac there briefly. So I think we'll, I'm assuming that's a universal phenomenon, not just for me. So um, I still I see Eric and Todd moving, so that's good. So let's, we'll, we'll, what we'll do is we'll keep going and we'll come back to Mac um, when his connection recovers. We're going to switch to our final topic now then, which is, uh, we call it the digital experience versus the revenue mindset. And I teed it up at the beginning about, if you can create a great digital experience, then patient satisfaction and revenue should follow. We've already seen that with Eric uh, from a revenue perspective earlier on. But um, uh, Eric, uh, t tell me, uh, how do you know at Henry Ford whether this experience is, is, is working for your, for your patients? Yeah, you know, so I, I talked earlier about that traditional approach of, you know, focus on yield and payments and, um, you know, that, that's sort of old school. I think we have to look now at, at what the patients think about our platform and how they're engaging and utilizing these self-service tools. Uh, ultimately, we focus a lot on the net promoter score. Um, Henry Ford Health System is currently at a, you know, a 44, I think, industry average 
it might be in the next couple of slides is around 25. Um, and so, you know, we're really focused on making sure that the patient has a positive experience in the application and they can resolve their financial need. Uh, we look at all feedback received um, from the net promoter score questions, which has really been eye-opening for us. And if a patient leaves a comment that we need to respond to, we respond to that patient's comment. Um, and, and frankly, we've improved our workflow because of it. One of the things that we really saw in the comment section was this need or desire for a more detailed bill. You know, the patient likes that high level summary, it's quick and easy, but when they have questions and they wanna dig in, uh, they, were, they were giving us that feedback. And so we partnered with VisitPay and you know, we allow the patient the ability to now uh, self-service uh, an itemized bill where they can see detail on their charges. Uh, you know, ultimately, we're just focused on uh, you know, getting more patients into the platform because we do think that drives uh, a better experience for the patient. Uh, we're using things like our website to encourage adoption. Uh, we're working with our internal marketing team uh, to, to find those digital patients <laughs> and engage with those digital patients, which most likely means our social channels, uh, uh, you know, to put messages and videos and things like that to drive folks to the right place. Uh, but ultimately, we think the future of, of the revenue cycle metric is really monitoring the engagement of the patient uh, in, in your tool, because uh, ultimately digital engagement is driving yield at Henry Ford. I think there's a video we can watch here uh, that we put together as well to encourage folks uh, to sign up for bill pay when it was a newer product to sort of highlight some of the benefits. Yeah, let's do that. I'll play it. I'll play it right now, Eric. And and this is something that's up on your website right now. And I remember working with your digital team to promote it on your Facebook page as well. So let's watch right. the overview we created for for your patients. Healthcare bills can be hard to understand and difficult to pay, so we did something about it. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I messed that up. Um, Healthcare bills can be hard to understand and difficult to pay, so we did something about it. Introducing Henry Ford Bill Pay, the new easier way to pay and even finance your medical bills online. With Henry Ford Bill Pay, you get all your billing details in a single monthly statement including a breakdown of what your insurance covers for each visit, giving you clarity on what you owe. Need a little help managing your bill? Henry Ford Bill Pay gives you the option to set up a payment plan that makes sense for your budget. Or pay your full bill quickly and safely with a few clicks. It's also great for families. You can manage your entire family's hospital and physician bills in one place. Text or email alerts mean you never miss a payment due date. And because you manage everything in one place online, there's no more waiting on the phone. Sign up now to enjoy all the benefits of the new, more convenient way to pay your bills at Henry Ford. Awesome. That, that was, that's great. It's good to, good to see and good to share that, Eric, and commend you and your team for being so, let's say, muscular in uh, in getting the word out through all channels available to you, Todd. Let's uh, let's switch gear to to Intermountain. Um, I want to show um, a slide here on some of what you're seeing. Um, Eric has talked about Net Promoter Score. Um, just a word on that. I think we use a variety of surveying mechanisms within the Visit Pay platform. Net Promoter Score is not the only one that we use, but it is a useful one that we've automated in the tool. And of course, we're all familiar from other consumer settings with the Net Promoter Score question. How likely are you to recommend service X to a, to a friend or colleague? We asked that in the platform uh, about specifically the financial experience to see whether we are generating promoters or detractors. And of course, this is a promoter or a detractor for the health system overall. The patient doesn't know that they're using VisitPay. And our point here is that we think it's important to generate loyal patients from the financial experience, people who will return back to the health system overall. So Todd would really like to dig into that a little bit with you and what you think is the link between a 
positive financial experience and what why that matters long term for Intermountain from a patient loyalty perspective. Well, I think it's it's evident to most folks I, that that having the patient come away from the end of their experience in many cases, which could carry on for weeks and, and perhaps months, be positive. So that as they're talking about whatever component they pick, <clears throat> they can identify, yeah, this was a good this was a good experience for us. I think it's it's clear that you know in healthcare we've used lots of different um, survey methods. Press Ganey is one that we use, and I think most health systems continue to use, and we use it today to grab one component of that that may may be an indication of the patient's experience, right, when they're in our system. Um, but it is only one small component, and traditionally, you know, I think everyone understands that that the payer was key. The payer. Um, was paying a fairly large portion of the bill, and we expected that the members who were a part of that payer network would come along with them. But more and more, what we're seeing is that the patient is making choice, and the payers are producing an environment, even by nature of the fact that, that our, our, our government systems are producing an environment where patients can choose. And so we, we for sure want to make certain that the billing and the financial experience that they have um, is, is top notch. You know, a 45 um, net promoter score in, compares quite well to say a target at 43, which is a non-healthcare organization or Apple at 47. And, and I just think that that's tremendous to see through the visit pay and the financial experience tool, a way for, um, for us to kind of compare ourselves against other industries where they're focused almost entirely on um, bringing the customers back, bring, creating the loyalty that's, that's important for them to maintain the volumes that they need. Intermountain is very um, proactively working towards keeping people well. It's a different approach, and, and we have no intention of, of stopping. Um, we know that a lot of healthcare is focused on taking care of people when they're ill, and, and we're going to do that as well and better than anyone um, else is doing right now, we believe. Um, but at the same time, what we're wanting to do is encourage this inter interaction, interaction with the patient consumer that keeps them well, that keeps them in an environment that they don't have to be inside of the system. And then when they do come, they have the experience that would say, okay, I can come back to that. Um, margins are a lot thinner. And so keeping them um, inside of our network and working with us is important to us. So, I mean, you can see some of the, the comments that were made um, inside of the technology that we've used. Um, and how people feel about their using using this technology to manage their financial obligation. Um, it's, it's been wonderful for us. That's great, Todd. Yeah, and it's with all of our all of the health systems using VisitPay, a large regional superpowers, let's say, and and uh, we want to play our part in helping create those loyal patients and keep them in your health system, um, Mac. Uh, let's finish this section before we jump to lessons learned in the Q and A with with your thoughts on um, the importance of the financial experience to, to patients and to and to health systems. Certainly. So again, the, the the feedback we've received from providers has categorically been the the essential need to again the reduce those friction points, the pain points make it as seamless as possible. Uh, to your point earlier, Will, that you just shared about VisitPay being a, a leader in that area, the goal is to not only, again, drive those revenues during the time of COVID, that's more top of mind than ever, but obviously it's also very important to look at the specifics of how are we engaging? Again, where are we meeting the patients where they're at? Are we impacting them in a way that is not a negative reaction? The goal is not to have someone uh, think poorly of a health system or a facility, uh, the healthcare provider, the goal is to build that loyalty. The goal is to help them feel like they are, again, empowered. They have access to tools to be able to have control over their own uh, financial well-being, so to speak, when it comes to their healthcare provider and, and that interaction. Uh, one of the other major areas is consolidation. So being able to have a, mm -hmm. a, a single EOB or a single bill uh, platform where they can go in, the patient can not only take care of themselves, uh, they can help, they can also look at their family members, they can see other people who may be uh, part of that organ, part of their family, so they can actually have it all in one place. 
this is something that providers tell us is very, very top of mind because there is such disparity between uh, different, and it's very fractured and balkanized in terms of this part of the system doesn't communicate with the other. Uh, if it's an outpatient facility versus an inpatient facility, as part of the same IDN, they may not talk to each other. So this is where uh, a visit pay and other vendors like visit pay are trying to produce a format that is brings everybody together, provides a, a less burdensome ish, uh, experience. We believe that, that uh, from our feedback and the responses we've had, that is that simplification of the payment process is absolutely one of the major reasons why people, uh, providers are electing to go that route and to look at opportunities like what VisitPay provides. Yeah, that's great, Matt. I'm glad you brought up consolidation uh, as well. I think uh, uh, that our research again shows how important that is for patients to 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 see all of their uh, visits in in one place. Um, thank you. So let's let's move to our towards our conclusion now. Um, I, I asked Eric and Todd just to think about some some lessons learned between them. Uh, let's see, between Henry Ford and Intermountain, we've there's nearly three quarters of a million um, visit pay users. So these are big big projects that we've been working on together. So would love, you know, Eric, maybe you can start. Uh, what are some of the things that you've learned from from this journey that we've been on? Yeah, so, well, I had sort of two related ideas. I think the one is that you cannot over-communicate the changes that you're making to your patient community. Um, you know, uh, some there, there's your early adopters that are they're easy to accept new technology and feel comfortable with it. Um, but, but those folks that are used to a process or used to a, a workflow uh, really want to know ahead of time that things are changing and that the change is coming and, and, and what is part of that change. You know, the other thing that we've learned and we've partnered with VisitPay on are different ways to communicate to different populations of patients, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a new patient, whether it's a patient with a balance. Those folks that are using my chart are an easier win because we know that they're digitally engaged. And so really contouring messages to different groups of folks has been effective to us. But, but probably the easiest audience that gets overlooked are your own employees. And so, uh, you know, we, we, took that, we took that on uh, before we went live and really made sure that um, our employees were engaged and that they were educated to be advocates for the change because it was a big platform change for us. Uh, we created communications like what you saw, the video obviously, but, but also newsletter communications. We did some education sessions uh, with those folks that, that might interact outside of the revenue cycle uh, you know, cashiers in the business office, those kinds of, or uh, at the different locations. Uh, we joined staff meetings, especially if we could do a, you know, a large Zoom meeting for a group of folks to, to really just educate everybody on what the changes were and, and how it's a benefit and could, to encourage our own employees to uh, sign up for bill pay so that they could be subject matter experts. Yes, that's great. I'm glad you brought that up because we always stress that and really making employees the advocates is is a great, great approach to take. So I heartily endorse that comment. Todd, from, from your perspective, um, we've been on this journey together for, for quite some years now. What, 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 how do you reflect on, on that? Well, I mean, I would say that the consumer is hungry for what we have to offer here. I. I I think that Intermountain's approach was very slow, deliberate. Let's adopt with a small subset of the population. Let's adopt with our employees. Let's expand. And, and, and while I think that there was some merit at that time to consider that, I do think that if I scan the horizon today, particularly in the world that we live in today, over 4,000% increase in telehealth visit, over you know, I, I look at all the, the restaurants and establishments that are leveraging technology in a virtual way in order to continue to engage their consumers and customers so that they can stay with them. And I think it's almost that the, the consumers are demanding that type of interaction. And I think that we should have moved faster. I mean, I really believe that uh, while I, I think we're in a good place and I think the accelerated growth we're seeing by way of this integrated My Health platform is making a difference, I, I, I would encourage those who are listening to, you know, not just to dip your foot in the water, but I think that you need to reach out around all of the, um, the tools that are around you, perhaps 
that you can draw in, including this one, you know, integrating in, we had technology that would calculate and estimate what the patient would owe. Well, that wasn't being created by VisitPay, but it was created by another third party. And what we could do by way of that My Health Plus platform is bring those together, make them seamless and not to wait, right? Because you're waiting to have all of the functionality sitting in one place. But I think there's a lot of clever experts who are able to design the view and the look so that it, it is you, it is your company, it is in our case, Intermountain Healthcare, um, so that our patients know who we are and they can leverage that functionality. But moving quickly, I think is, is imperative right now, particularly given the circumstances. I don't think that, that um, the virtual environment that we now find ourselves in will go away anytime soon. Yeah. Agree, Todd. Agree, and 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 um, with that, let's transition into the Q and A. And and uh, for a few minutes here, we've had a tremendous number of questions. Thank you so much um, to all of you who have put questions in. We've touched on some of them as we've gone, uh, but there's a lot here, and we'll cover a couple uh, before we run out of time. Uh, one theme I noticed in, if I aggregate several questions together, is around the uh, non-digital patient, and I just. Maybe I can just touch on that for 30 seconds. We've talked a lot here about digital, digital self-service, but what about the people that don't want to engage digitally? Um, that, that, that maybe is in itself perhaps a topic for, a, for another, another webinar as to how uh, we can uh, enable uh, intelligent and tailored financing options for folks who are, still want to dial in and talk over the phone. But one point on digital engagement, we look across all of our clients at the, um, we, we know a lot about the guarantors that are using the platform. Uh, some of our recent analysis across all our clients showed that it's not until you get to about 80 years old, eight zero, that we see the proportion of um, self-service users declining significantly relative to balance. So that tells us that the digital adoption really is very strong right through to that 80 plus year old age group. It's only after there that you see that drop off. And we see, and remember this is across millions of patients, we see now 50%, over 50% of the logins to our platform come from a mobile device. So yes, we have to account for the non-digital, non-self-service user. But that population is enormous uh, and is mobile uh, and is older than perhaps you might think. The other theme that's come up a lot in questions is pre-service. Uh, again, that's another topic for another webinar, but how do you use a platform like this to make payments on estimates or set up financing plans on estimates? Uh, that's absolutely something we're doing and we're doing at scale and we'd love to come back to that another time. Um, uh, maybe a question uh, for you, Eric. You showed a great chart on um, revenue performance at Henry Ford. You, there's a question here about what, what do you think was the greatest driver of that increase in patient payments? I don't think there's a silver bullet necessarily, but what are some of the silver bullets? Yeah, you know, I think that the the patient can self service, and and it opens a it opens a door for folks that might not have known there were options, or might not have thought that there were options available to them. I talked to a patient the other day that called to compliment us. Uh, she she had signed up for bill pay when she received her last statement, her final notice, and uh, so she she decided to register as a bill pay user to see what it was about. She logged in for the first time. And really, you know, with our, we slightly expanded some of our payment arrangements. She was able to, to get herself on a payment arrangement. And she's actually made a, a couple of monthly payments right around $70. Uh, you know, she was impacted by COVID. She lost her job from it. Um, luckily, she has a spouse that helps support her. But ultimately, she, she, didn't, she was embarrassed by her financial situation and didn't want to have a conversation, but, but wanted to self-serve. And so I think there's a whole population of folks that if you provide them options, they're much more likely to resolve that, that balance than they were before. Eric, thank you, that's great. Um, I'm really conscious of time. It's now 59 minutes past the hour. So I think we need to end. We could have another hour just of, of questions and that's uh, a shame not to do that. But um, I really uh, would like to thank you all, uh, Todd, Eric and Mac for joining me today. It's been a privilege for me to listen to you and, and, and learn from you as I always do. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for attending and encourage you if you want to engage with us more about the patient to consumer experience in, in healthcare finance, 
join our Twitter chat on on March the third. It'll be a fun session with uh, with Shep Hyken, uh, who is a, an outside of healthcare voice, talking about uh, great uh, patient and, and consumer facing uh, experiences. With that, I'd like to thank you all for participating and hand back to Christelle. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Will. Again, I want to thank you, Will, Todd, Eric, and Matt for your excellent presentation today and for VisitPay for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.